Welcome to my channel. As I mentioned in my first video of this today, uh, I'm not going to be doing any music reactions today. I have two things that I want to share with you. The first I shared in the first video, and this will be the second one. Uh, I have a daughter who has recently been born again and is writing me regularly now and telling me about her faith and about what she's learning. And she mentioned a guy to me, she said, he was very intense. And she said, you might find him interesting. So I looked him up. His name is Nathan Reynolds. And the first thing I found, I found his YouTube channel. And the very first thing I saw was this video that's titled Bound by Death, Fighting for Life. And I thought, well, now that sounds interesting. What is that? And I looked at it. It's three hours and 43 minutes long. It took me two days to finish it. So this is not something you can just sit down and watch unless you've got unlimited amounts of time. But I highly recommend you watch it because once you've heard what Nathan has to say, there will be no question in your mind that there is a spiritual world that lurks behind the physical world that we live in. We as humans tend to think that only those things that we can see and that we can feel and touch and smell and taste exist. And we tend to poo-poo any idea of what we call ghosts or uh, spirits or that kind of thing. We, we think it's, it's not real. Well, if you listen to Nathan, you're going to find out it's a lot more real than you ever thought it was. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a little bit of it, and I'm going to put the link in the description. I put it in the description of the last video that I did yesterday, as I said I would. And I'll put it in this one, and I'm also going to put in the description a link to his book, which is... I got to pull this up so I can see the name of it because I've forgotten it already. Uh, Snatched from the Flames. I thought about giving you some background on Nathan, but I'm just going to let him give it to you himself. So this is Nathan Reynolds. And this is not Nathan you're looking at here. He's being interviewed on a podcast called The Confessionals. But this is Nathan Reynolds telling his story. Excited about. So um, that said, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do an overtime show. Uh, so the first half, what we're going to do is going to focus on your family history, your history, your childhood up into, I guess, adult life. And we're going to let you kind of steer the ship. But kind of getting your story out there in as full context as possible. Um, like I told you before, there is no handcuffs and there's no handcuffs on time. So feel free to just talk and share. And then uh, we'll migrate into more of your military experience because it kind of goes hand in hand from what I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you started sharing some things with me about feral people and creatures being created and, and kill teams and all this stuff. And I'm just like, what in the world did I get myself into? I'm just super excited. So <laughs> with that said, man, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, really. Man. Absolutely. So, so uh, you you come from a family that I've seen described online. I don't know if you describe it this way, but you come from a family that uh, people have described it as Illuminati family. Mm -hmm. Is that how you would describe it? That's not how I would describe it in the same way. I'll be honest. It's a uh, I think it's just a popular catchphrase that yeah. a lot of people are borrowing into. Now, I come, I come from a family that they believe they are descendants of the old gods. That's the really? best way to say it. That they believe that they are carriers of a seed line that gives them the divine right to rule. And that is what gives them justification spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, scientifically to dominate the lesser species known as humans. Humans literally means a lesser species of man. And they do not believe they are a human. In the same way they believe they are something other than and that's descendants of this hierarchical ruling species that is from the celestial realm that descended in the days of jared and came down and procreated with the daughters of men and that they still trace their seed line back to gilgamesh till nimrod 
And so this is what the dynastic families believe they have is a superiority in their genetics on one side and the ability to commune with the divine. And so their children are progenitors of these, some might call them abreactions, mutations, these skills, psychic abilities, that kind of stuff, <clears throat> all variants of it. And so they raise up their children in this path with which involves a tremendous amount of shattering of the soul and the identity so that there's compartmentalization within and it allows them the ability to train their child up in a way that makes them conducive towards the family. I call them the family. That's that's what I called them. You know, it's a better word for mafia than anything else. But no, we don't we didn't call ourselves like my family wouldn't ever call themselves Illuminists. Yeah. Right. They're Luciferian. That's for certain. They they worship Halel and Shahar as he's really known, but different reasons than what people are ascribed to, you know. Interesting. All right. So uh, I want you to to start from the beginning of what your childhood is like and just walk us through this. Uh, but before you do, you just, you just said something that I, I got to ask you before I forget. Are What they believe, do you believe is true in the sense of uh, them being able to trace back their lineage to the fallen? Some of them, yes. I believe they absolutely can. Do you think that's in your blood? I believe it was. Yeah, I believe it is. Yeah. I believe there's no way to uh, physiologically necessarily, ch my blood's been augmented a lot over the years. I, I volunteered for a lot of stuff and said yes to everything that they could ever give me that would make me better mm -hmm. than what I was. I was on a desperate quest for relief. And so I volunteered for all kinds of stuff and I volunteered for stuff that was transhuman in its nature. Really? And it augmented me quickly, you know? And, uh, that was brutal because then there's this, I lived a lot longer than I expected. Let me just put it that way. I did not think I would ever see 18, never even comprehended the idea that I would ever know a family that wasn't this other thing where the powers of control and access were given through the abuse of children. That's what I knew as normal. And I knew that people were corrupt and monsters and we're willing to devour each other to rise to the top. I understood what wolves were when they ran the world. And so it was very hard for me to get to a place where I could believe that I could be redeemed because I had witnessed enough of things in the families that make it seem like you are, ir I am irredeemable forever. Mm. And it took me, there was a single, but one book that made a massive difference in that, which was called The Gospel to Every Creature. And I believe it's written by John Darnell. It is very hard to find. I have a copy, and but it's been scrubbed. And it's the, the good news to Nephilim, vampires, and transhumans, you know? And it, it, it helped me to see that maybe I wasn't anathema, that maybe just because I have this seed line in me, that maybe just because I'm a progenitor of the offspring, of the fallen, that it doesn't mean that I'm not able to be redeemed because no matter what, by blood or by belief, I believe that we have a Messiah that overcame by the, by the, and we can overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony and not loving our lives when faced with death. And it was that powerful encounter with the almighty, with the true judge of all the earth, who I can make an appeal to, who can give me a new bloodline, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what he offers to everyone. Right. And so I do believe that's available to those that come from these families. That's wild. Uh, we, I didn't. Um, last year in the Christmas season, I took the last two weeks of the year off and I uh, had other people host the show. And my friend Joel uh, did an episode that we that he called Good Nephilim. And uh, he he kind of goes into this idea of Nephilim being able to be redeemed. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's a concept that I feel like is not has not been tapped into a whole lot and he did on my show for the i think the first time and since then he's kind of uncovered more information to back up his claims um but having you know a real life nephilim here no, uh, but it's just it, it kind of goes into that that um concept you know yeah. and so that's that's why i asked you because i was like hold on like that's that's pretty wild like mm -hmm. you know to be a, to, like have i ever encountered somebody who comes from that bloodline Maybe. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people, mm -hmm. but how many times do you come across somebody that does come from that bloodline and acknowledges it, knows it, you mm -hmm. know, that's, that's one, that's another thing. And so that's why I wanted to ask you that. So, um, you kind of hit on the childhood stuff right there in that kind of description. Um, was it something that came from complete childhood where it's like from your earliest memories is just been kind of 
manipulated and jacked up. And, mm. and what was that like for you growing up? The Reynolds family on my father's side, they're all from the East Coast out here and they're a dynastic family. You know, like my, my great grandfather, a man named Don Potter Reynolds was the architect, uh, the head of engineering for the president as the president of the American Society of Civil Engineering back in the 80s. And he's the one who put the new torch in the Luciferian hand of the Statue of Liberty of Columbia. Hmm. And so he's a master Mason Luciferian in that way. And he was so much of the shot caller for the family at that time, especially when I came into being. And, uh, but my dad left that thing and began, moved out to the Southwest and started a different empire. And so a lot of how it works in the families is you, you got two main approaches. If you've got unlimited access to wealth, power, like really, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about power, like unlimited raw power, where a phone call, the phone book is far more powerful than the bank account because it's who you know can open doors to power anywhere mm -hmm. else in the entire world. And that's where everything was. So you can leave with nothing, but then you can go build. And if you need the phone book, there's a price to be paid. And the price to be paid is generally one of your children. This is like the reality accident. It seems bizarre to some, but a child is generally a chosen child out of the family is given over as an offering to the family. And they're the ones who's gonna go through this left-hand path. They're gonna experience the desecration of their soul, their identity, and they're gonna become an agent for the family that is owned completely. And there's like a legal trustee that is given over to it. There's a board of directors that sits over it. Like these are real legal confines for how the wealth is distributed out there. And so in order to build your empire, you got to be able to go prove yourself. And that's what he ended up doing out in the Southwest. And he moved to Arizona, an area called Flagstaff, Arizona. And where I was born, that is a place that's a high place, Mount Humphreys. It's a volcanic peak that sit there. And the top of it is where the Hopi Indian and a lot of people had gathered forever to commune with the fallen. They believed that the sons of the sky would come down every season at the winter solstice and they would abide from the winter solstice to the summer solstice there. And so this was a place where they would give their daughters over to them. This is Hopi mythology, like 101, you know, and they would make these Kachina dolls, which were an effigy of the, fall, of the, the what I would say is a watcher angel that would come and the daughter would be given to him and she would place that over her bed throughout her life, you know, and that was where, that's her familiar spirit, right? That's where I was born into. And the people that still practice that old religion, that's the way I referred to it, they still do this and they still take their children up there to give them over to them on these high days. And so I was born into that and I was born through that seed line and into that ritual magic world. And, um, but my, my mother's side are extreme Catholics and Jesuits through and through. And so her father ran a different operation in Southern California, which was much more based on the child exploitation side of the equation. And he operated out of Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Lake Havasu, for those of you that are unfamiliar, sits in the absolute desert border of Arizona and California. And it has the Colorado River that's been dammed up and they created an artificial lake there. And it was a secret military base back in World War II. That was called uh, Site 6. And it was a stopover point uh, crossing the desert for soldiers going there. And they would made it into a rest and recuperation area. And so it was a party city from its foundation. It had a lot of underground structures that were built into it as a refueling point. And in the 1960s, a guy named Robert P. McCulloch bought it. And he bought it and he also purchased the London Bridge that crossed the River Thames. And he had it shipped over here stone by stone. And while they were doing that, they excavated 80 bodies that were entombed inside it in a practice that's called anirment where you would sacrifice a person and bury them alive in the walls of the foundation. And so there's all these chambers in this facility of the London Bridge where they would do torture and uh, all kinds of ritual stuff. But this is why the sing song nursery rhyme, the London bridge is falling down, falling down. That's a nursery rhyme to talk about how you have to give your children over to the government so you can hold up the London bridge and they would literally take their children. They've, this is in the history book of the museum at Lake Havasu City. You can see these bodies of these children that were sacrificed inside the walls of that space. So he bought that as a charged object. He bought that as a, tor as a portal mechanism and they built in Lake Havasu City with another designer from Le the Disneyland and they literally built a pleasure island. That's what it was facilitated for. And they, they designed it so that it would be a retirement community that would facilitate the exploitation of children. And that's exclusively what that city was founded and built for. And so the, the, the original founders of that operated out of Knights of Columbus predominantly as a wing of the Jesuits. And that's the business down there. It's an industry to cover up child. You got a bunch of old men running around with little boys and everybody thinks they're grandchildren and grand, you know, nephews and nieces and all that rest. And so all along that area down there is where I would be taken from my earliest days and shattered 
abused, traumatized, Jeez. systemically so. Um, but it's for behavioral modification purposes. That's the end goal of, of the, uh, the abuse is to shatter your willingness to resist and to break your will. And once they own you and you have been woefully convinced you can never get out, you're, you give in. And that's what, uh, that's what happened. I became the person who I was died, you know, and the person they wanted me to become was what was born out of that disgusting Phoenix ashes, you know? Wow. How, all right, how long does that process take? I mean, was this like just, just a few years of your childhood mm. or was this like a constant thing throughout your teen years or what? Mm. I mean, it, every individual is different. How long does it take to break a dog? Mm. That's the, that was the approach they took with me. You know, you find out every, everybody has a different talents and giftings and capabilities and capacities. And so the, in the beginning phase, a lot of it is you're just raising them up a little more normally. There's a lot of early trauma stuff that's hard to articulate and can be messy with memory. And, and But as I got older, like five and six years old, man, it, it became very apparent that I had a desire for justice. That was like the sole deepest desire that I had, you know, was I wanted to, I wanted people to know freedom because I had been so deprived of it from day one. And there was no, there's, there's this practice of switching mothers. They have cult, you'll have a cult mother and then they have your regular mom and then they create this trauma bonding so that you'll bond with anybody that they want you to do. And this happens by taking you away from your mom and your dad constantly and giving you new mom and dad, new uncles, new aunts, right? And so you're living in this constant state of destabilization. And so it's, it's as that destabilization happens and that patterning is built up, that's when a lot of the programming comes in to stabilize these new personalities and these new pursuits and endeavors. But I had this zealousness to see injustice stopped and they preyed on that. And so they gave me opportunities to fight back against these perverts who are abusing children and they would, build up in me this rage, this need for vengeance. And then they would let me release that on somebody. And in the beginning, it was people I knew were bad guys, guys I'd seen abuse children. And I would slice their throats up, man. I would tear them to freaking ribbons. And I loved it because I finally felt like I could stop something that I knew was evil. And I thought this was the way to stop all these monsters in the world. I just wanted to hunt monsters in the night. I just wanted to go down in the tunnels and hunt. And that's what they kind of created in me, this just freak of a need to hunt. And then they would bury that away and you go back to normal life and you go back to Christian school and you go back to the Whoa. regular life and your parents act like it's just normal, you know? But they're like, you you got to have cover stories for why your child's all beat up and bruised and your face is smashed. And like, I've had multiple reconstructed plastic surgeries from fights, you know, like fighting for my stinking life. You got to have cover stories. So we would move around constantly. My parents would move us around every, sometimes every six months or not. But once you have a friend or a teacher or somebody notices, starts asking questions or you start bonding with somebody that's outside the cult, they're not going to tolerate that. And so we would move all the time. And now my sisters on the other side, they weren't roped into this thing. I was in a male cult. This is the Brotherhood of the Snake down in Lake Havasu. But this is, uh, my sisters weren't caught up in the same thing, but they were caught up by the family as a whole. And so this carried on and we moved into this place called Sholo Pine Top Lakeside, Arizona. And this is where an area, they would move to these specific high places where the veil is really thin. There's a very famous story about uh, a guy who had an alien encounter out there, Snowflake, Arizona. And uh, this is an area where there's, I was right on the Apache Re Reservation, White Mountain Apache Reservation was hundred yards from my door and they would go out into the Apache reservation to these specific high places and do these rituals and this ritual magic. And a lot of that involved, that was when it was the worst to me because I was old enough to understand how vile what was happening, you know, in ritual magic. And at the same time, I was the most readily influenced by the family side of the equation. I thought the family and the military was the way out, but I hated this occult side of it because I saw, I mean, I saw men become monsters physically in front of my eyes. Other things come out of people's mouths. Other things come through their eyes. Like I, I witnessed enough transfiguration to know that this stuff is 100% stalking in the darkness. And I don't want that to rule me forever, you know, but it was hard to not resist, you know, you're just, you're in it. Well, so... Okay, that's enough. Uh, that's just the first 18 minutes or so of a three hour and 43 minute uh, interview. This, 
this video is not for the faint of heart. If you're afraid of things in the dark, then you probably don't want to watch this video. But on the other hand, if watching it will open your eyes to the truth that there is an entire spirit realm that lurks behind everything in the world and behind every action in the world, then it might be worth it for you to understand that because far too often, especially among Christians, we don't think that that world exists. We think that it's dead, that it, that it went out with the acts of the apostles, that there are no longer miracles, there are no longer healings, there are no longer people raised from the dead. And the opposite side of that is the evil side, where people are put to death and children are abused and very evil things are being done. He talks about all of it, both here and in his book. And I'll put links to both in the description of this video. But if you have the stomach for it, I highly recommend that you watch this interview with Nathan. Because it will change you. It will change the way you think about life. It will change the way you think about God. It will change the way you think about the devil because you will realize he is real and that explains all the things that you see going on now all the crazy stuff that you see in the world the what's going on in the Middle East with Israel and, and Hezbollah and Hamas it's all explained by the spiritual yeah, I know it looks to you like it's just the Israelis fighting the Hamas and the Hezbollah and Iran. But it's much, much bigger than that. And it's my prayer that you will become aware of that. Aware to the point where you're willing to make a decision to stand with God. And to put your life and the lives of the people that you love in the hands of God. Because it's important. It really is important. This is the Vietnam Era Vet out.